Hello, welcome to uh, Dr. Bowers' YouTube channel. Uh, I'm very happy to be today with you. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing a live stream. Um, this is 11:20 uh, New York time. And uh, if you don't know me, I'm a Columbia uh, scholar. I work at Columbia University, uh, the classics department, and I focus my research on uh, religion. I study uh, how uh, religion and modernity uh, built themselves uh, into an agreement or not, into a competition in, during the 19th century. And uh, I focus uh, my studies on Catholicism, but also in paganism, in ancient paganism, especially in the Greco-Roman area. Uh, today, I'm very happy to have uh, in this channel, uh, which is a rather new channel, uh, a celebrity, uh, one of the great scholars in the internet, one of the persons that has done most to promote paganism in our modern times, uh, Survive the Jive. Welcome uh, to my humble channel. Uh, I hope we can have a, a great discussion today. Thank you, Boaz. Nice to be on here and uh, glad to see other channels promoting uh, comparative mythology and, and paganism uh, on YouTube. That's good. So uh, if you don't know Survive the Jive, uh, he has uh, been building for many years a great deal of scholarship on genetics, but also on uh, how paganism can be adopted in modern times and on Anglo-Saxon studies, late medieval uh, English history. Um, and also he has a great uh, dialogue in comparative mythology uh, from India to uh, Rome and to uh, Scandinavia. So I'm um, very, very happy to have you here. And um, let's start the conversation. Um, I'd like today to, uh, to focus on what modern pagans uh, should be uh, knowing when they need to practice and believe today, how uh, they need to uh, address these issues. Because uh, when when we mention paganism, people think of Wicca or may think of uh, of a more uh, new age uh, streams of paganism that uh, have become more popular, and they definitely obscure what what paganism really is. So. Uh, I'd like you to ask a, a very basic question. Um, what should modern pagans practice and believe today? And let's start uh, with um, what would be the main practice, for example, that a pagan uh, should be adopting when uh, considering these things? Well, the main thing that all pagan religions in Europe were defined by was dedication to deities um, and that's what it has to be defined by now of course wiccans or as if they could go back in time they would seem their religions would still seem very foreign to the actual pagans but for a variety of reasons partly because they because of the way they've been modernized but even if paganism hadn't have been replaced by Christianity, no matter what happened, it would have changed anyway. So we can be certain that no matter what we do now, when we try and practice paganism, it's not going to be exactly the same as it was in the old days. But one thing that has to be consistent is what paganism was all about, which is about the gods. It's about worshipping the gods. It's put very simple. Sometimes people want to, New Age people want to reduce the gods to archetypes or mere symbols of natural phenomena or metaphors for physical phenomena. That's not what paganism was about. So it was about the belief in actual deities, divine personalities uh, who have existences like human existence, but different. And that they could be placated and that their favor could be, grant, uh, could be granted uh, through uh, offerings now i know that the neoplatonists had more uh, 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 there's another version another perspective and i think neoplatonism should inform uh, pagans now because it's such an important uh, you know insight into uh, advanced metaphysics in pre-christian europe uh, they would say that you can't alter a god through your sacrifice but the sacrifice is still necessary uh, from the perspective of theurgists because 
it's um, a way of demonstrating devotion. But I think that the common man, the common pagan probably did believe he, it was more simple, basically like, I'm offering this sacrifice so that you'll help me in return. And wh whichever perspective you put, you take on it, you still have, you got to offer sacrifices. So I think the, to, to put it in the plainest possible terms, you must offer sacrifices to be a pagan. Now we could go into the details of how you do that and in what format, and that's a bigger topic, but. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting. You mentioned, uh, I think, very important elements here. Uh, you, for example, uh, mentioned the, the organic evolution of paganism uh, that was truncated by the, the rise of Christianity, uh, but also you mentioned Neoplatonism. Neo I think uh, this is a very important uh, metaphysical system that we should be able to present because I think that uh, it's been um, very academic oriented uh, throughout the centuries and uh, it has been very secluded in, a, in an environment of specialists, which makes sense because uh, this is uh, sometimes very obscure and intricate philosophy, but at the same time, it permeates a mentality that would uh, be critically uh, useful for understanding how uh, pagans uh, should think uh, today if they want to connect with uh, this organic tradition of paganism. Yeah, I agree. It has been, it's, it's rather inside an ivory tower and you can get all kinds of interesting discussions about Neoplatonism online and things, but they, are, they do generally take place between philosophers, students of philosophy. Occasionally these, stu these philosophers or students of philosophy, professors of philosophy are themselves practicing pagans, but more often they're not. But in any case, the average person, the normal person who's a pagan might not see how these the this ways of thinking which are basically the religious dimension to platonic thought how they could apply to them and i think that the the way that it should apply is mainly in in the context of theurgy um of developed by like proclus and iamblichus because that is a justification a, met, a, a, a theological justification for what was at the heart of daily practice for all pagans in every single pagan uh, path in Europe, whether it's Baltic, Nordic, Mediterranean, whatever, that's sacrifice, that's right and ritual. And I mean, right and ritual in Indo-European context means sacrifice. You mentioned uh, two lines here. I'd like to uh, take this first and then go back to uh, what is uh, daily sacrifice. Uh, Jamblichus, for example, uh, was big on the mystery cults. Uh, mystery cults, for uh, those who don't know, were uh, a kind of a sects that were uh, very popular during uh, Imperial Roman times, and they they indeed were pagan, uh, but sometimes they deviate from uh, the the, nor the normal or the average uh, pagan uh, that we can imagine in sacrifices in temples or in other places, and they were focusing more on the on esoteric knowledge, on initiation, or in uh, exclusive or almost exclusive devotion to uh, some deities. Um, what is your opinion about uh, those pagans that when they uh, revive pa paganism, they are only reviving a mystery cult and they kind of deny, uh, you know, the right of mainstream paganism, ancient mainstream paganism to be because we should just adopt the most initiatic or esoteric component of these uh, mystery cults. Are you talking about things like Mithraic cults revival or in, in this context of like Masonic? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, for example, uh, there is a stream of pagans that uh, claim to be Orphic uh, and to connect with Orphism, which is a, a mystery cult from Greece that was right. uh, very popular yeah. among Dionysiac uh, mm -hmm people of Dionysiac uh, worship. And mm. there is also the Mithra, uh, the Mithras uh, uh, mystery cult that it uh, has been very popular. But also I'm thinking of uh, Pythagoreans or uh, Theurgy that was Jamblichus uh, uh, or the, for example, the Chaldean mysteries um, oracles that were uh, so popular and that influenced Neo Neoplatonism. And all these mystery cults, even though uh, they have, uh, a small following um, 
they're becoming uh, they have a presence in paganism and sometimes they they want to be exclusive of what paganism is and uh, we should consider that paganism was very plural and as such uh, we should uh, understand that paganism today can be plural within the the right mentality or framework so what is uh, how you relate to uh, these uh, mystery cults that uh, may be becoming uh, bigger uh, today well i could say that that that's i overall i'd say that the tendency is a positive one and because it's it's still a revival of paganism and of course during especially in late stages of paganism there was many mystery cults and you could people say that the rise of christianity was in the context of the rise in popularity of mystery cults like that that of mithras but um of course they are, they existed for much longer and then you know in egypt they had many of these kind of cults around specific deities rising up and then falling and disappearing and um, I have no doubt that similar things occurred everywhere. There was even something similar among the Scythians, I believe, that's recorded um, by the Greeks. So it's not it's not something that I consider incongruous to pagan practice. Like it it wasn't the mainstream thing among paganism, but like the common man just had a normal, a more basic, earthy form of of uh, immediate relationship with the gods to, to help him with his daily requirements, his spiritual requirements. But the there were these initiatory cults and they had a different function for different roles in society, the Mithraic one, for example, for the military people in Rome. And I have no doubt similar things uh, were um, uh, occurring among the Germanic pagans and I follow a Germanic pastor so that takes an interest, I take an interest in that. I think that the Adenic cult which we see is in the sources that come down to us how we understand Germanic paganism is is very prominent but initially I think it was probably less so he was still a very important god Odin but the the, the Odinic cult was initially a military kind of it had this connection with with a, with a, a function for men who were not necessarily military as in their, their they have a lifestyle of soldiers but that they're engaging in a military activity of raiding or of something like that, where they're becoming like the so the souls of the dead, and that this initiate and there was an initiatory aspect. An initiation is vital in in all cultures. It's not. It plays a major function in all religions or all traditional societies, and that function isn't purely. I mean, it, it's fully integrated into the religious worldview, but it isn't purely religious in function. It has a profane function. I believe that people need initiations to transition from one stage of life to the next. And the absence of initiatory rights within our culture today is a source of great suffering, for, especially for young men, but also for young women, but young people in general, I'd say, and um, that we need those. And uh, it makes sense to me that in a, a culture that we have now, which is devoid of initiations, that people would find initiatory cults of specific deities to be appealing to them. Um, but yeah, it's worth pointing out, as you did, that these were not the, you know, the common form of paganism that you'd find everywhere. That's, uh, that's a very, very interesting point you mentioned about the, the the lack of uh, the initiation uh, in the modern society uh, or rite of passage properly. What would be your uh, your proposal if you had to say, okay, um, pagans should have this kind of rite of passage? And I'm talking more in the in the mainstream uh, side, not on the mystery cult that have very uh, solid uh, initiation practices. What would be your uh, your guess of this should be the rite of passage? that we should incorporate in our uh, pagan practice? Well, I think the, the thing is, not only do we have like, you know, different types of paganism in Europe being revived, Greek, Nordic, or whatever, but within that, within these, there are different groups of people who are finding different ways of doing it. And there was never a, I mean, besides things like the Roman state, which had some regulation over how some religious functions would happen because they would become state functions, state celebrations. That that was not normal. I would say most paganism in Europe did not have a central organization to to regulate it in that way. And so often, you know, that would be regional variations just by town by town or village by village, or um, not only I'm talking about just like ethnocultural differences, but within an ethnoculture, like within the Germanic, for example. So nowadays, you know, we in a context of 
pluralistic societies of the West where we have to coexist with multiple different religions and and being able to have a, a self-identifier of a religion is important. So you can say, I am this. And then when you have a, a certain amount of people saying, I am this, they also need to decide between them what this is. So when you say Germanic paganism, so there becomes this desire to have some kind of uniformity for what Germanic paganism is, but there is no central authority to determine that. And um, the result is that people want to define you know, they argue very heatedly and have done since before I was born in neo-pagan neo communities about what, how things should be done. I think this is somewhat a waste of energy. What you should focus on is your your actual community, build, building a community of real world contacts and establishing rights within that community. Um, and then that they, they can't be questioned then by other people because within the pagan worldview, that is an, your, your community, they call them hof sometimes in Germanic paganism. I don't know what the Greek Roman equivalent would be, but you know, if they have a temple somewhere, then the people who attend that temple will surely, surely have shared rights and, and, and uh, that's important. And of course, one of the shared rights that they would establish is a, a, a right of initiation or perhaps different forms of initiation. My, me personally, I've just, I, I, I engaged with, I have interacted with several different um, organizations in Britain, in private pagan organizations, and they have their own books of, separate books of rules, books of, in, of rights and how they do things. And I don't question how they, what they've established. But on, the, on, the, on another sense, I also, with a group of friends, established my own little, well, our own little, um, private community in which we therefore will we determine what we have and we agree between us based on our own scholarship what the correct rights and initiation should be and we've come to an agreement on that and how we should be initiated in within our within some hofs for example all that need is needed for initiation is a, de a declaration of loyalty to that hof or that that group and to the deity that they are devoted to but ours will be different. We're, um, we're, we're, what we've established is that we believe that obviously initiate, initiate to be initiate. You need to be initiated by someone who's already initiated. And if we if we are a new organization and we and this and we accept that the the line of knowledge of mystical knowledge that was existed in pagan times to pass on that mystical knowledge does not exist. I've never been initiated in a formal way by anyone. I've spent a lot of my life, 10 years now, studying paganism uh, and in all different forms of, of related scholarly fields to try and in, to uh, broaden my knowledge of paganism and religious practice, looking at archaeology, history, ancient uh, classical paganism, medieval paganism, Hinduism, ancient and modern, and other things uh, to try and understand how best to go about this. And uh, what we've determined is that um, one will be sort of symbolically self-initiated uh, with the with the approval of the others, and that self-initiation will be a a passing from profane time into the sacred time of the sacred time that, uh, as defined by Georges de Musil, uh, in which. Odin was self-initiated and taught himself the he learned the runes and so that he could teach mankind the runes. And rune in Germanic literally means esoteric knowledge. It's uh, the, its application to uh, the, the the writing system is secondary to its initial meaning of esoteric secrets. So that uh, runic initiation, self-initiation, is will be a, a, a replication of the Odinic one. And then having uh, completed this initiation. The initial initiator will be qualified to initiate the other members of the group. Yeah, that you you really exposed a very a very critical component uh, because um, you know, the the lack of lineage, which is the the transmission of a tradition or of specific knowledge, is something that has been heavily affecting uh, paganism because there is a there is this continuity and uh, many groups. Uh, either claim that, oh, we preserve some uh, uh, cult or secret uh, lineages for centuries, which would be the cult. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't think they do. <laughs> They're lying, I think. But, uh... Or we take the approach that you are taking, that I think is the honest approach, 
uh, saying, okay, we need to self-initiate ourselves and mm -hmm. uh, and establish the lineage uh, that will uh, will give continuity after uh, these uh, tremendous heritage of centuries uh, to uh, to these uh, pagan tradition. Um, the other thing I really I really like is the the approach of the community. This is uh, I think that both for uh, what uh, Greek or Roman um, paganism was, but also of how um, the the Mediterranean uh, Europe is oriented to the state. Uh, we have lost this uh, perspective of community and how community enables us to uh, to create and establish uh, new practices or recover old practices. I think that uh, we expect too much from the state and we expect that uh, something uh, should run through the state. Uh, and this connects with a conversation that we have had previously about um, uh, public uh, sacrifices and pub or public worship uh, today, which uh, would be um, the the culmination of of these uh, pagan practice um, in a, in established community. Um, and I'd like to know um, how in the in the in the setting that you have described you you situate uh, this uh, public worship among uh, the members of the community. Um, well, I believe that uh, pub the public worship is a difficult one at the moment because um, obviously we're not fully, the states that we live in in Western countries do not fully, usually don't recognize the validity of these religions or if they do so it's only in a, a, in a, a bureaucratic way and not in any, in, in, without, with any enthusiasm or, but um, Although Lithuania has now recognized that the pagan religion, for example, which is great. But um, the the idea of, I mean, even Yule in the Germanic sources is clearly integrated with the, the state. If you want to, it doesn't seem right to use the term state in the context of, of Norse Germanic yeah, culture yeah, at that time, because it was so, it was less, um, less bureaucratic, to be honest. But uh, the it's not, nevertheless like the Jarl was in charge of the proceedings it wasn't a, just a religious leader a godi who was in charge of it it was the profane political leaders who were expected to organize the logistics of making sure people were bringing w the necessary ingredients for sacrifice in sacrificial beer sacrificial animals that there was enough food for everyone at the feast punishing the people who didn't provide what they were expected to provide you know administering these punishments this is all state activity now of course we can't have the state punishing people for not doing stuff like bringing in the proper sacrifices like used to happen in pagan we don't have that support from the state and um it's just fact that paganism emerged po the popularity of paganism in the west now is to some extent tied up with the countercultural movement of the second world war uh, of post second world war and that these are anti-authoritarian and that there is no real desire to integrate the daily practice with a, an acknowledgement of the state authority uh, in most Western countries, whether that would mean, you know, praying for the, the health of the president in America or for the queen in Britain, I would say it would be the queen. Now, I know a lot of people would say stuff like, oh, but I don't like that ruler. I don't respect them very much. Or I think they've done bad things or they're not a pagan. They're you know, they're outsider. They're a Christian. But I don't really think that's actually taking on the pagan mindset properly because um, the, the loyalty to the state was like, it's a part of uprightness. And that's a major part of pagan morality. Heathen morality is very different to uh, Judeo-Christian morality one of the central aspects of it is being seen to be upright in the community and being part of this community. So the, the countercultural elements are somewhat at odds with the, the actual reality of paganism. And, that, and that's why I, I personally am a monarchist. I support the, the royal family, even though the royal family are not, are not pagans. Although they did have initiations into Druid, the, Druid the, the royal family were initiated as Druids in neo-pagan Druidic cults in, the, in, the, in, in recent times. That was a they were have acknowledged and been integrated into these magical societies, so they're not totally far removed from it. But they are they aren't uh, they're, they're strictly speaking Anglican. But that's the official religion of the state, and that would make sense if they were practicing a minority religion. It would cause 
difficulties for the state. They shouldn't practice minority religion in my, it, it wouldn't work as, as, as state authorities. Um, but they, we then, they should, they should respect us as an indigenous and uh, a minority religion, but um, uh, we should also show our respect. And Yule is centered around one of the main Yule toasters to the, to the king or queen. So um, I encourage people who, uh, pagans who are, who are generally anti-authoritarian to put aside the realities of how the um of, of their criticisms which you're allowed to have for your your the, the head of state and to to integrate your you know your 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 religious beliefs with your acknowledgement for the health of the state your acknowledgement for a desire for the health of the state if you're if you find if you believe that your state if you live in a country where your leaders are corrupt you should be praying to the gods for better leaders and for or to at least encourage your leaders to improve that's one of the things that should be that could should be a part of your faith um as for the a future in which state um state mandated or state approved um rituals occur i would like to see that but realistically i don't anticipated anytime soon even if i was made prime minister of britain tomorrow i couldn't actually implement that realistically without causing problems for and, pagans and for non-pagans yeah and how about if uh, this could be in a small scale for example uh, you you're now living uh, in in england but you live in a uni you, you live in a village or a town that has a has a human uh, scale that is something that you can know the people around you you can know all the people living in the in the community uh, if such community would be um more uh, leaning to a uh, towards paganism or you are you have a same uh, state of mind and you you want to create something that it's more uh, official but it's just at the local level um mm. would this work or would be seen as an eccentric um move yeah, it would be eccentric because the term community is often used. I use the term, I can say, a community for this pagan group that I've started to help build. But we don't live in a community in the literal sense. We live in different places and we meet up for rituals. Because I live in a real community, local people, you know, I've got a baker, I've got a, there's a, the, the, there's a village farmer, there's a village church there's a real community and that is something actually real and i think the the use of the word community in a, in its modern term kind of undermines the literal and traditional meaning of community but um yeah this is something important but it's not really possible to integrate it with paganism because the people here aren't pagan and they're not interested in it however it is possible in another sense for example there are rituals that the villagers here um participate in that go back to pagan times. They don't see them as pagan. They they're either you know they either see them as just non-religious or they see them as Christian. They're just things we've always done, like when they sing the sing to the apple trees and to to make them have better um, crops and things to get, or, or they pour cider onto the trees to make you know to this kind of thing is goes back to pagan. These are offerings. When I do it with them my experience of the same event that they participate in is different because i'm a pagan i experience it at the metaphysical level and they don't but um that that's um that's up to me uh not that that's not something i can you know question about how they do it but maybe well i mean i want to promote people having metaphysical uh, relationships with their environment uh in a pagan sense um but I do that mainly through YouTube. I don't proselytize to my neighbors. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally understand. Uh, I, I grew up in a village, uh, in a small village in the near the Mediterranean, and we we have a, a lot of uh, ancient pagan uh, stuff that uh, has been uh, codified as folklore. Um, and I see, uh, I see the utility, and I, I, I have the same perspective as you when uh, doing the. Or participating in this uh, folklore, I, I give different meaning, but people around me uh, don't have this meaning. How how you would suggest um, a person arriving to paganism that uh, that's looking for you know um, 
cases that they can relate uh, closely. Uh, for example, a person coming from Christianity or sacramental Christianity, either Anglicanism or Catholicism, that has uh, this set of practices, but also a mindset, and uh, he wants to uh, be able to have a smooth transition. And he wants to take um, on the pagan elements, either in folklore or in Christianity, that he can reuse in a, in a pagan practice. Uh, either is a Germanic or a Slavic or a, a Roman if it's in the South. Uh, how, how would you suggest uh, this approach? Are you, do you mean to be like outwardly, exoterically Christian, but I in inwardly a pagan? Well, it's a person that, I mean, I come, uh, I come from uh, Christianity, that is a little bit complex, the Christian background I have. I assume that you, you come from a Christian background and um, we, we have all these elements that, um, for example, the use of uh, water at an entrance of the church, the aspersion of water uh, at the beginning of a, of a worship service. Uh, these are, for example, elements that come directly from the illustration, the, the, or, or even from the, the kermits, the, the, the lustral water from, uh, from Greek temples. So these are pagan elements that have been fossilized in Christianity. At the same time, you have all the folklore. You, for example, you were talking about singing to the trees, that this is a pagan uh, uh, worship that is just a folkloric element today. How a person that is, uh, let's say, breaking up with uh, uh, his uh, Christian background and wants to uh, enter to paganism can right. be of use of these elements for a uh, minute. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very much in favor of using these existing folkloric remnants of paganism that exist in Christian and, and in secular contexts and and, and appropriate reappropriating them to a pagan context um, this is actually much easier to do than simply doing away with everything and trying to build up a whole new calendar and uh, system of uh, rituals and things all that's required is to change the mindset and and because you, you, if you're re religiously minded, you, you, the re the event has a totally different meaning. So it's really about approaching the event with a different perspective. This ritual, whether it's a bonfire, you know, you're having a bonfire, you're burning an effigy, or you're singing to trees, or whatever. We know that that the, the pagan context of its origins, and actually many of the participants know whether they're atheists or Christians too, but they don't experience it as a pagan event just because they know it was pagan. To experience it as a pagan event, you have to believe in, you have to have the beliefs of the people who who founded this uh, rite, which is to re-enter the divine the divine time, sacred time, where you are participating in the original rite, the same rite the gods participated in. You're entering into the same frame of sacred time that your ancestors were in when they maintained this ritual for centuries, that it was brought back, it brought to the present time. Outwardly, you're just another participant in the event, whether it's the May Day, Maypole, or whatever, all these different pagan things. But I would say that was a good idea and that, that it really requires an effort of, of the, uh, well, a, a, an effort of the mind. It's about changing your perspective and, uh, that could be hard. That's more difficult than it's said for some people, especially when you've been, if you've been raised as an atheist, I think you must have especially enormous obstacles to re, uh, to re, to, to learn to experience the divine. At least if you've been raised a Christian, you have some experience of it, of mystical experiences, especially if you're if you've been raised Catholic. But um, yeah, uh, I mean, the good thing about these things is that they're there already and you don't have to, build them out from scratch you don't have to reinvent the wheel you know like with some rituals and uh, like actual proper sacrifices we kind of have to do that because that that they don't exist anymore in the same way but with with other events they can be done and and i guess if you just participate in them either you re you replicate the same event but do it with pagans exclusively if you have that many in your community or if not that you just participate in the the non-pagan one or version of it but but experience it in a pagan context. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, 
Love it. <laughs> I couldn't couldn't agree more. You 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 have a very uh, strong educational perspective of um, informing uh, the pagan mindset. Besides this, uh, what is the role of identity uh, in in paganism? But when I I say identity, I I rather say um, of how. Um, you know, uh, Wiccan or neo pagans have projected identity into uh, into the, this new uh, worships because mm. they they are more uh, inclined to have identity politics. Um, right. How um, how a, a person that is uh, entering paganism needs to relate to uh, this incredible urge that uh, Western societies have now of uh, playing the identity politics everywhere. How uh, paganists need to relate to, uh, let me call it this way, the real identity and discard identity politics. Well, there's no denying that paganism was in every, in every place it existed, heavily tied to identity from the beginning. They didn't consider it religion, they considered it identity in a sense for example, the Germans wouldn't have considered their religion the Germanic religion. They would simply consider the religion an element of being a German. That was just one part of it. The Germans, they wear these clothes, they worship these gods, they eat this food. It's all part of a cultural package. And the same with, with more organized, larger, you know, like the Greeks and Romans. The same is just applied in a different context. The tribe, the, without instead of tribal affiliations, you have city-states or whatever. And then you have you know, an ethnic, a wider ethnic identity of Hellens, uh, just as the German tribes had a wider Germanic identity, which we know that they did have, not just because of Romans, but because of Anglo-Saxons referring to the Goths as their cousins and the Lombards as their their, their relatives. They knew about these ancient uh, pan-tribal relationships, and that these, and we now see with genetic science that these ancient ethnic kinship. Uh, identity uh, networks across Europe reflect biological realities as well. Um, but they didn't have ideas of nationhood in the, like we have now. Those are all a creation of the post-Christian era. Nor did they have ideas of identity politics connected to, um, you know, sexuality. Like there's no such thing as a gay community until modern times. Now, what I, for example, what I say about the groups I've been involved in, these are not communities like my village. This village is a community. If everyone in this village practiced the same form of paganism, that would be just like in old pagan times, but they don't. And there's nowhere that paganism exists like that, which is the original form of identity. But those who practice paganism now still impose identity into it, just as it always has had, but they either want to do it in the in the sense of a nation or eth or, or racial ideas which aren't precisely the same as the tribal and ethnic affiliations that existed in pagan times but have some similarities to them or to the um or to even more modern notions of identity based on things like you know countercultural subcultural identities or sexual identities or political affiliations and things like that which are certainly even more uh, in Congress to the old pagan religion. Uh, it's hard, I would, I, I, I should say, uh, it's for those who don't know, I'm generally on the right politically. So my um, sympathies are more likely to lie with people who whose uh, form of identity that they express through their worship, through their, uh, their religious identity is tied to an ethnic sense of ethnicity, tied through blood relations, um, rather than ident identity formed through political affiliations or other like uh, less fixed forms of identity. Uh, but it could be argued against me that since these forms of, uh, of collective identity where like people get together like I, my group do, we don't, we're not, you know, more related to each other than the people we exclude so that it isn't really uh, any different to what, um, you know, more, uh, Counterculturals uh, or left-wing people would do in their forms of worship, uh, and also since paganism changed, they could argue, "Oh, well, this is a new form of identity, and uh, that, that and that's how it um, 
how it is paganism evolving. So who am I to question? And of course, because there's no central authorities in paganism, it's very difficult for me to, to say that what they're doing is wrong. But um, I would say that I, uh, I don't agree with them and um, that I, and whatever they do in their kindreds and hoffs and whatever, where they, where they may say that uh, their, their shared uh, belief system, which is, is inevitably political, is what binds them together as a kindred. Uh, I would say that that is transitory and not really a proper identity, uh, and that identity has to be based on something uh, more innate, more unchangeable, uh, and uh, and that that's more in keeping with the initial sense of identity around and ethnicity that was present uh, at the time that these mythologies were, were and were experienced directly by actual pagans uh, in in a, in a religious sense. Um, I hope that answers it. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's a it's a fantastic answer, and it opens um, another question that it's um, you know uh, in uh, in the nineteenth century many national narratives that are not ethnic and are national, so it's a romantic and post revolutionary French Revolution. I mean, uh, identities um, they try to um, in the in the conservative side they they try to say okay if you want to be uh, a good, uh, a good Britain. You need to be uh, Anglican, and they are going to, for example, exclude Catholics. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, identity. it's going to be a heavy, heavy nineteenth-century debate. But the same in in, in France. If you are a good French, uh, you are Catholic, um, and they don't really like the the French project. Uh, many points. So, is there an opportunity? Uh, and I think that I'm thinking in your Anglo-Saxon uh, studies and uh, the. The things that you have been uh, studying in Anglo-Saxon uh, history, and uh, the things that you have been, uh, you know, uh, explaining to to the broad audience, is there an opportunity to create a shift and uh, bring paganism into the being the right way to be part of uh, a nation or an ethnicity? Is a uh, is a way to repeat what the 19th century uh, intellectuals did of associating uh, religion with a nation. It's, it's an exercise that can be done today in saying, well, uh, if you want to be part of this uh, identity, uh, you need to know that the, the most authentic way to be part of this community is embracing this uh, type of uh, culture, but also this type of religion. Um, yes and no. I think that there should be a form of, I mean, there already is a, some, some form of um, ethnic identification as a motivation for uh, conversion to paganism. That's already a driving force within it. And certainly I think there are plenty of pagans whose adoption of their ancestral religion was a, uh, an expression of a desire to be loyal to their people, to be uh, upstanding, you know, citizens, or if you can use citizens, maybe is the wrong word because it's not always about being a citizen, but they wanted to be loyal to their people. Um, and it, it, it mirrors that civic identity. But I don't think it's possible to exclude um, those who don't, uh, not at this stage and not in any foreseeable future. Let's be realistic. Paganism yeah. is very much of a minority religion, and it will remain so for, throughout my lifetime, and probably, and if, and maybe forever. But maybe I'd like to see it rise in popularity. But I'm not. I'm. I'm just being realistic now. It's a minority religion. For, for most people, it's at best an eccentricity. Some people consider it completely crazy, and a lot of people just see it as completely crazy. Um, and uh, that's the reality. So the idea that you could then say to people, uh, you're not a proper Englishman because you don't practice Anglo-Saxon paganism is, uh, is, too, is completely far removed from the reality of what England is now. It's a, 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 a nation that was until very recently entirely Christian and is now in a kind of post-Christian limbo where people sort of maintain Christian values but don't have any of the uh, sacred experience of the world that a Christian has um, and uh, it's and they're quite materialistic often and uh, you know even the Christians often only you know probably don't really believe in any of it anymore so um, yeah I mean 
among patriots, I'd say that I could say, or patriotic groups, or people who want to, or I mean, I would like to get to to the, it. Would, it would be nice to see we get to the stage where a public figure in the United Kingdom, for example, could could be could openly express that their pagan their pagan belief, and for this to be widely recognised as a, a virtuous uh, expression of their of their uh, patriotism. But um, of course, patriot patriotism alone is not a good motivation for picking a religious path. Yeah. It's, but uh, but it is it is it, it could be seen as being an extension of that, and that's that that fits into the, what I was saying earlier about the pagan view and being about about being upstanding within the community. At the moment, I think that generally, if a person reveals, if a, you know, whether, whatever they are, whether they're a, a politician or whatever, or a teacher even, they reveal they're a pagan, that might raise eyebrows. So what I would like to see is at least getting to the stage where the eyebrows won't be raised. It's just seen as, like, not crazy. And then beyond that, maybe even being seen as a, an express, a virtuous expression of patriotism that that non-pagans could appreciate. But to, to to expect that we could, you know, have it beyond that at this stage is just uh, is too far to go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's it's good to have uh, these uh, realism and be aware of how uh, how the situation is. However, uh, seeing uh, the Baltic countries that they have uh, had this kind of i mean they were the 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 last uh, territory in europe to be christianized and they they have had this uh, advancement of paganism after the fall of the soviet union that it's uh at least surprising to see uh, how far they have gone in uh, in this sense mm. but my understanding is in lithuania there was some political maneuvering it was something to do with i can't remember the exact details but it's a right-wing catholic country for the most part conservative in values and there's different conservative factions with loyalties and towards other you know uh, surrounding you know states like poland or or, or whatever or, and um and there was some maneuvering where this this was like uh, giving recognition to this pagan group was like a way at, at one party to get at the other party or something i don't really understand but this is what a lithuanian told me once anyway yeah. It's still an achievement on the part of the pagans, but I don't rec I don't think that the average Lithuanian uh, regards paganism very much differently to the average British person regards paganism. Um, I mean, a lot of the really really pagan stuff I saw in Lithuania was being done by Catholics, because I mean there were there were, there were this event this like this midsummer event, but and there were obviously people there who were pagan because they were chanting the names of gods and things but i don't think most of the people there were pagan and it wasn't a, an officially just a pagan event it was just i mean it was it was a, a lithuanian event but that in a way makes it very pagan because that's how the romans saw like the event you know this is the day of the festival these are the sacrifices you will participate it is a legal requirement and we don't really care if you're a jew the rest of the year but on this day, you will participate in the pagan celebrations because that is what was required. And the exact same thing was enforced by King Horkon in Norway. He said, Christians, you will participate in this rite and you will, pagans, all participate together. It doesn't matter what your religion is, you will participate. So that does show that kind of civic requirements that paganism used to have. Um, and, and perhaps that's, that's still reflected in Lithuania uh, to a certain extent, although it's not the state enforcing that participation but there was this kind of communal just they weren't there because they were pagans they're there because they're lithuanians yeah being together and it's a, yeah that's a that's a great pagan spirit it's, a, it's yeah great. definitely community yeah yeah so uh just to uh be uh, finishing up uh what would be your recommendation in terms of uh readings if someone uh being that you uh are uh, promoting this educational way to paganism. What would be uh, your recommended readings if someone needs to have a, a crash course in uh, paganism? Well, the, 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 it's a it's a tricky one because uh, I don't I never read a book that told me how to be a pagan, and a lot of people want that book, and some people want me to write it, but I I haven't done that. I, I thought I might do it one day. There are people who have written books I know of that I ha others have recommended to me that I haven't writ written, uh, read, sorry, um, that do this um, within the Germanic, but they're quite specific to Germanic uh, paganism. 
I gather that um, as a true and native European religion by Stephen McNallan is a good introduction to being a pagan, but I haven't read it. Um, I have read Colin Cleary's On Summoning the Gods, which doesn't actually tell you anything about how you've got to do daily practice, but it does tell you a bit about how to adopt the necessary mindset where you can see and feel the presence of the gods in the way that your ancestors would have. And uh, also I recommend, with, I mean, this is getting also quite scholarly. It's things like Georges de Mazille is very good, the sacred and profane to just, if you're an atheist, especially, if you've been raised atheist and you want to be religious now, Georges de Mazille will explain to you the difference between the modern non-religious mindset and the religious mindset. So you can understand what's required for, for a starting point. Then this is all just forgetting that, I mean, the perspective where you're ready to, 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 to involve yourself in a ritual, but the actual knowledge of the specific rituals and pagan practices and stuff, you've got to read history books or you've got to read primary sources. So if you're a Greek pagan, you're, I would say read the Odyssey, read the Iliad, of course, there's so much in there, but also read secondary sources by historians who have written all about based on archaeology and historical sources, what religion was like in ancient Rome or ancient Greece, or what the religion of the Norse was like. Um, historians are not usually not pagan, they're not practicing pagans, but they've quite coolly and objectively collected the facts on what occurred then. And then you can look at that and base your practices on that. Then, uh, so just, yeah, depending on what your, um, your the path you're going to follow, uh, look at just um, some sources, mainstream history books on those on that religion. Um, you don't necessarily have to read books by pagans to understand the details of it. In fact, for example, Germanic pagan or Celtic paganism or Slavic paganism, all the sources are written down, the original primary sources are written down by Christians. So it can be a problem if you just buy the Eddas the, and read like the Eddic sources, for example, and read them by themselves without any background, you can't pass the Christian influence from the others without a background knowledge in Roman Catholicism of uh, 12th century Iceland. You just can't. But there's so much scholarship on that subject that many of people have done that for you already. So you'd be foolish to, um, to, 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 to not look at secondary scholarship from historians as well. Um, but yeah, the, the, the initial primary sources are really great. The Eddas for uh, Germanic pagans, the Iliad and Odyssey. And then of course, I really recommend to a lot of people to check out the Rig Veda. If you're, in, if you're practicing any form of European paganism, the Rig Veda is an ancient Hindu text, which has so much, uh, provides so much insight into the mindset of actual practicing in the Europeans in the early days. You can of course meet Hindus and go and talk to Hindus and see how they worship today in your local, wherever the local Hindu temple is. And they're quite open and friendly people, so you can learn about it. But be, bear in mind that Hinduism has developed a lot over the last 3,000 years, and it's not the same as the um, as the religion of the Vedic religion that was first brought to India. And that, uh, so therefore it isn't quite, I mean, there's a lot in, in Indian religion that isn't, wasn't in uh, uh, European religion. That doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, later on the Neoplatonists were very influenced by what was happening in India. In India, India was, uh, was a source of uh, inspiration for many people in in later in Greece. So uh, Indian Indian metaphysics is highly advanced. But um, just to make sure you don't get confused, you should be aware that a lot of what's developments if it developed in India is not uh, is not what uh, has was was in ancient Europe. But the Rig Veda is a very quite a good reflection of early Indo-European religion, and that includes European religions. That's that's a fantastic recommendation. I, I really like it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a, a tremendous conversation. I think that uh, if there is a new by people that really don't uh, uh, know uh, where to be going for uh, having pagan resources or having a pagan mindset, to knowing what they can do, what they should avoid. Uh, I think that this uh, this conversation can help really uh, to uh, have a, a good idea of what to do and what not to do. 
Uh, I'm very happy to to have had this conversation. I think it's uh, I, I'm very excited. <laughs> so uh, I'm I, very happy. I hope that your channel does well, Vaz, and uh, thank you very much for having me. And I hope it is as helpful for people as you say yeah. it will be, because uh, yeah, it's a difficult um, it's difficult getting started in paganism. It's difficult being a pagan um, in many respects because there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to and there's a lot of knowledge to sort through to get to the facts. And there's a lot of unfortunately bad information out there as well. And um, sometimes people don't know where to look, and and, and I, I can understand why people get a bit up, uh, feel a bit, they despair at it. But uh, yeah, I hope your your channel will be help, another great source out there that people can rely on. Let's hope so. So, uh, Tom, survive the jive. Thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to many more videos from you. Uh, information about paganism, but also on Anglo-Saxon history and genetics. Thank you so much. Thank you.